The story will come back to that because it sounds like something to do. I, I hope you do. I'll defer to Senator Mark Wayne Muller. Well, thank you. And uh, considering the chairman doesn't want to hear any of that information because I believe he's pretty biased in his opinion already, Mr. Schultz, I'll give you an opportunity to finish that if you'll do it quick. Thank you very much. So, as you might imagine, uh, we're very curious to understand what happened in Buffalo. And uh, we later found out that this individual, which, which was hired in 2020, was paid for and under the employment of the union that was basically trying to organize Starbucks. We later found out there was more than one person. And so you might want to ask yourself, uh, what, where's the fairness, right. the objectivity, and the integrity of what we're, we're talking about here today? No, and I, I, I mean, if you're anti-union, as a CEO, you're anti-union busting or you're for union busting. I'm not saying you're anti-union. I'm just saying that it seems like to me, as a former CEO, not nearly at the success that you were at, sir, and I'm not trying to defend your company uh, because, quite frankly, politically, we're on totally different ends of the spectrum. Um, and so the irony of this hearing is actually kind of funny. And I do want to point out some hypocrisy about this hearing with the chairman and it's not trying to get personal. All this information is going to be very public. But the fact that you can't defend your company because you want to have a good relationship with your employees and you believe in employee value, which we all do. Any CEO knows that the success of our companies are based on our employees. We get that. Um, but it seems like unions today, all they want to do is fight with, the, with, the, with their, their employees or their employer. The same employer that is hiring those, those team members. And that friction causes a, a, a very volatile and, 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 and tough workplace. And if the company and the employees aren't in the same boat, rowing in the same direction, then they can't, neither one can be successful. And, 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 and unions themselves, if you're part of a union, you can never be an executive, you can never be a manager, and never be a CEO. And if you can't be an executive or a manager or the CEO, then how are you actually going to implement the changes that the unions want in those, in those positions to begin with? And it seems like they actually hold back their team members. Mm -hmm. But I take offense to, to the, the chairman pointing out that all CEOs are corrupt because they're millionaires. You know, if you make a lot of money, you're, you're corrupt. If, yet no. it, yet it, it's, it's bothering to me because, Mr. Chairman, you yourself have been very successful. Rightfully so. Glad you have. And you've been in office for 28 years, and you and your wife has, have, have immersed a, a wealth of over $8 million dollars. And, and in fact, your quote on, 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 being, on, on being wealthy and being a millionaire was, well, if you write a bestseller, you can be a millionaire too. If you can be a millionaire, why can't Mr. Schultz and other CEOs be millionaires and be honest too? If that's the case, then why is it that Mr. Schultz, who actually creates jobs and a bestseller of a book, isn't creating any jobs? Why is it that he's corrupt and you're not? Why is it that all CEOs are corrupt because they're wealthy, and yet our chairman, who is wealthy, and I'm glad you are, you're not. Guys, the government's role is to create an environment for entrepreneurs, for go-getters, for, for world changers, to be successful in life. The U.S. government is, to des is designed for people that want to succeed can. We can go out and achieve anything that we choose to. But when you lean towards socialism, what you think is government is the answer and unions are the choice. And if you're against us, then you're dead wrong and you must be corrupt. That's not the world we're living in. That's not the America that we believe in. And I'm not against unions. If you want to choose to be in a union, be in a union. But if you choose not to, then you choose not to. And that's why I'm good with right-to-work states. That's honestly why unions actually thrive in Oklahoma and we're right-to-work states, because it creates a happy environment and a, and a good environment, because employees get to choose what they want to be part of. And the employer can have a say in it. What is wrong with choice? What is wrong with employees having a choice? What is wrong with a CEO defending his company? and openly saying that he is providing good benefits and paying higher than everybody else. But yet, if you're not part of a union, you're also paying starvation wages. What hypocrisy. What bias. Chairman, 
you are chair of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pension Committee. We shouldn't have a biased approach. We should have what's best for America and all those that want to thrive and work in it. And so while we politically disagree, Mr. Schultz, I applaud you for your success. And I applaud all the CEOs out there for their success and all the employees that work hard, that's in the same boat, that's making their companies great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me respond. As the senator did mention my name, I think. <laughs> and I think you got an all-time record here. You've made more misstatements in a shorter period of time than I have ever heard. Please correct well, me. Well, if I'm worth $8 million, dollars, excuse me. It's all public. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Excuse me. Yes, sir. If I'm worth $8 million, that's good news to me. <laughs> I'm not aware of it. That's a lie. All right. Number two. Part of public records. That's... You're probably looking at some phony right-wing internet stuff. It ain't true. No. All right, you should read I, beyond that. It is not true. It's part right? of public records. It, yeah. No, it is not public record. Okay. Well, you made 1.7 million on your public book. public record. You made 1.7 right? on your excuse book. Excuse me. I've got the mic now. Number two, make the statement I have that if you the mic billionaire? now. I've got it. You Did you not make time. that statement? You had your time. Okay. All right? You're not telling the truth. Second of all, you got no evidence that I have ever said that all CEOs are corrupt. I have never, ever said that. Probably not Further, all, but, but every time you talk about not, CEOs, you, you shouldn't say that. Say it. Furthermore, what this hearing is about is whether or not you talk about being pro-union. Really? What this hearing is about is whether workers have the constitutional right to form a union. The evidence is overwhelming, not from me but for the National Labor Relations Board is the time after time after time, despite what Mr. Schultz is saying. Starbucks has broken the law and has prevented workers from joining unions to collectively bargain for decent wages and benefits. Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Schultz, I want to begin. Senator Mullen. Thank you, and <clears throat> thank you for being here today. It was a pleasure meeting you. I, I do have to kind of address something beginning. Uh, you know, our, our chairman came out with a very strong comment, um, daring everybody, basically, that they disagreed with your qualifications to say it with a straight face. And as always, he always talks about starvation wages, in which I thought, man, he's really setting the tone here, but then I'm just starting to figure out that's just your personality. No offense there, but this is your personality. And, and I, but then I still understand, I don't understand the lack of knowledge, a basic, basic knowledge when this is the health, education, labor, and pension, the basic knowledge of understanding what labor cost really is. As a, as a business owner who's employed truly hundreds of people, um, labor is always going to have a beginning wage. And, and everything else goes from there. So you can't call a beginning wage a starvation wage if there's always going to be a beginning wage. I don't care what industry you're in, it's always going to start something. The product that industry is making is going to adjust whatever the cost of that final product is. It's going to be delivered to everybody. But that is actually what an apprenticeship program is too, because that's supposed to get people into the program to start working towards that. But yet apprenticeship programs themselves can actually be kind of restrictive because a lot of people that are entering these workforces that are, that are going to maybe you start requiring apprentices, they didn't want to go to college. But yet we keep expanding apprenticeship programs from one year to two year to three year to some apprenticeship programs are four years and longer. And it, individuals like, look, I didn't want to go to college. That's why I entered this workforce to begin with. So we got to think about what we're talking about when we start expanding apprenticeship programs. But it also understands the lack of, of of people that's running these programs, running the industry, of actually understanding what business is like, which is why so many of us, why you are, a, seems like a super nice individual, and we, we had a great conversation, that doesn't mean being nice qualifies you to, to be, be Secretary of Labor, because if you don't have that basic understanding of knowing what it's like, then how can you relate and truly represent both sides? For instance, have you, have you, have you ever been an employer of a business? It's a yes or no. I'm sorry. I have not, Senator, okay. but my parents have, no, no. have and you, my family no, is. Have you ever done it? Have, I, okay, I have then, not. Then you don't understand what it's like, how hard it is to actually sit awake at night trying to figure out how you're going to man a job when you don't have the people there and you know you're going to have to do it. 
Have you ever created or balanced a budget of, for a business? Um, yes or no? These are yes or no. real quick. I want to run through them as quick as I can. I'm going to take that as a no. Have you ever acquired or sold a business? I have not, Senator. Okay. Um, have you ever had to raise capital in order to launch a new business? I have not, Senator. Um, which goes back to one of your comments that you wrote about that I'll get to later. Have you ever had to provide quarterly reports to shareholders? Senator, I have not okay. done these things. Right, and I'm, I'm just going, this is qualifications, because sure. the chairman said, can you actually say, if you, say with a straight face if you're qualified on this? And these are points we're trying to make. Have you ever decided which health insurance plan you're going to offer to employees? I'm sorry, if I may. Now, I, if I'm, I'm going through these because I'm making a point. The chairman's one that threw down the gauntlet and said, I dare anybody to say this without a straight face. I'm just trying to make a point here. So have you ever, have you ever? I have not okay. chosen a health insurance plan for um, have you ever had a Have you ever had an employee file workers' comp that you had to either work with or, 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 or fight against? As an employer, no. Sir. Do you know what a workers' comp experience mod is? I do based on my work but in government. But you never had to actually apply it to your bottom line to figure out what your profit margins and, and, and bottom line is going to be. Have you ever filed taxes on behalf of business? I have not, Senator. Have you ever had to comply with federal regulations on a small business? No. Sir. So it's really hard to understand what it's like when you're getting mandated and regulations coming at you. Have you, ever, have you ever had your business model threatened by the federal government's overreach of regulations? No, Senator. I, see, I have. And that's what drove me here today. And when you have someone like yourself that, that uh, makes a comment like this, like you did in 2005, it says the very definition of a corporation as an entity that is created to permit maximum income and designed to insulate individuals who profit from the liability. That's your opinion about a corporation. Do you still stand by that? So I don't remember when I wrote that or the context in which I wrote it. I don't. I don't. Do you, it doesn't, there is no context to which this can be taken out of context. Do you still believe that that corporations are just the insulation to, to, pro, to, to shield individuals like myself? Because we don't have any liabilities and we have no li financial liabilities at all as a corporation, as an owner at all. I mean, I don't understand that. But do you still stand by that comment? Yes I, or no? I, I will tell you what I do stand by, Senator. No, no, I just need I, yes or no because I'm about ready to run out of time and i got one more question. Do you stand by that comment? I, I do stand by the important role that both employers and employees you play in our American economy. American society was built on white privilege and systemic racial subordination, to which you've written also? I, can, I, I, can I say what I do stand by, Senator? No, I I just, those are your comments. I'm asking, do you still believe on both those comments? You wrote those in your comments. It just, do you stand by those comments or do you not? You wrote them. Do you stand by them or not? I believe that we... No, ma'am. I'm just saying, do you believe what you said? They say yes or no. I will say this, Senator. I think it's a longer no conversation. If you, if you can't answer a heck no on this, Ms. Sue, then that's a huge problem. Because just like our chairman sometimes leads with the gavel with a biased opinion towards labor, you also will lead the secretary, uh, as Secretary of Labor or Labor Department with bias. Because you cannot say those type of statements like that and represent all sides. With that, I yield back. Senator Cassidy. I defer to Senator Mark Wayne Mullen. Thank you, uh, Senator, and um, thank you for our panelists for being here. I, I'm going to address a question real quick about why is it so expensive. Fourteen years ago, my wife and I uh, wanted to provide health care for our, for our employees. It was actually going to be a benefit because we were having a lot of employees miss work because they couldn't find child health care. So we went through the process of trying to set it up, and it was crazy how expensive it was. Then outside of that, the liability that it brought to our company honestly outweighed the benefit of it. Because of how much regulations that we pour on these, on these early child development centers, preschool, it makes it almost cost prohibitive. And so if we really want to fix cost, we should start looking at ourselves and seeing out a way that we can soften the amount of regulations and still keep our kids safe. Now, let me get to the to, to the point of my, my questions and kind of make a point here. When we're trying to federalize our education system. To me, it sounds like we're trying to move more towards socialism. Because when you federalize an education system, you're standardizing what you're going to be teaching our kids and taking the parents out of the ability to have a say in it. And, and so I have, very, I have a lot of concerns about this. And it still baffles me that the chairman of our committee, Health Education, I'm going to put, right, put that big, Health Education, Labor, and Pension Committee, is a, 
that was appointed by our Senate Democrats is a self-proclaimed socialist. I, I'm not just calling that. Chairman, you, you openly say that you're a socialist. In your book, Outsider uh, in the House, the chairman says, Bill Clinton is a moderate Democrat. I'm a Democrat socialist. That's over our education system. I have a book here in, here in front of me called Our Skin that has been endorsed by NACI. Uh, and I'm going to read exactly what this book says. You guys might find it interesting. A long time ago, way before you were born, a group of white people made up an idea called race. They sorted people by skin color and said that white people were better, smarter, prettier, and they deserved more than everybody else. This would be taught if we socialize our pre-K system. This would be taught. Do you disagree with that findings in the book? A thousand percent. How really? about we teach Jesus loves me? How about, how about this? In teaching Jesus loves, loves the little children, the lyrics go, red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in our sight. Now, which one would you think would be better? I'll ask everybody on the panel, which is better to teach? This, that is a, a story that was made up to teach our kids, three-year-olds who have no idea what race is, now all of a sudden is being taught that white people said this as a truth. Someone pointed at me that this being a truth, that white people developed race, that white people developed that, that all of a sudden that was our word that we developed. By the way, I'm Cherokee, Native American. I think we have experienced a little bit of racism before in my life, Chairman. Senator Mullen. So, so I ask everybody on the panel, which one is better to teach, this or the Jesus loves me lyrics? Ma'am, I'll start down here. Just tell yeah, me which yeah. one. I don't have time for an explanation. What I'll tell you, Senator Mullen, is that what children um, in these early years no, no, develop no, no. I their identity. I didn't the question. The, it's the important, question is, is which it's important one that our classrooms are. I'm just asking which one is better. To Let her answer the question, please. I, the, my question is this. She will which answer if she sees fit. Which one is better? It's important, this? It's important that children's identity that's and not language my and question. culture are recognized. That's not answering my question. And that's, that's what creates strong that, executive okay, function. If you don't want to answer my question, that's fine. Let's move on down the panel. Which one is better to be taught? This book or the Jesus Loves Me lyrics that says everybody's, that everybody's skin doesn't matter. They're all precious in his sight. I think it's important to teach that all children are seen and valued for who they are. And that's so, what But when you teach this, don't you think that other people are start saying that white kids are to blame? I think it's important. It's exactly what they're going to teach. It's exactly what it is, ma'am. I disagree. Um, first, it is important that we teach Jesus. And Absolutely. Jesus is what we teach. So which one is but better? But the reality is. So do you think this is Could the Could you answer the question, please? No, I don't want reality. I'm asking the question, which one is better? That is exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Got okay. it on tape. <laughs> misspoke. So uh, what I'm saying is, is which one is which? Which one is better to be taught, Mr. Chairman? Is it this or is it, or is it the Jesus? Is your question directed to me or Ms. Woman? Well, you keep interrupting me saying they're not asking the question. Ask and I wish you really sat on no, the no, question. No, no, no. It's his question. Time. He gets to dictate it. Which not one? Not dictate it. Ask the question. Which one? Talking to Ms. Woman, right? Yes. As I stated, Jesus is always first. Absolutely. I agree with that. So let me end with this because I still have more time because the chairman kept interrupting me. I'm going to close with two quotes, okay? The first is from John Adams. It says, morality and virtue are the foundation of a republic and necessary for society to be free. The second one is from our socialist communist, Joseph Stalin. That says, education is a weapon whose effect depends on who hands it is in and whom it is aimed. We got to be careful what we're trying to do here. With that, I yield back. Senator Bold, Casey, Senator Mullen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm just going to make an open comment here. I, I, I kind of feel like uh, hell's freezing over because um, Chairman Sanders and I actually agree on something, and it's that something needs to be done with PBMs. So I do appreciate you having this hearing and the order that we're having it, Chairman. Uh, it's that's actually a compliment coming from my side, if you can believe that. Uh, I, I want to I I point out uh, this chart behind me. This is the integration chart uh, where it starts showing um, how PBMs have integrated themselves 
and they become their own customer, which is kind of like the fox guarding the hen house. And, uh, and it's difficult when you start thinking about that Congress was actually wanted to help stand up the PBMs to help bring down cost. You've seen costs do nothing but skyrocket uh, on prescription drugs. At the same time, you've seen that PBMs have become literally a billion-dollar industry. In the last five years alone, you've seen uh, prescription drugs increase by 16%. At the same time, you've seen the net income of PBMs and their integrated companies grow substantially. Start thinking, why? I mean, if the billion dollars industry has grown up, it's not because of taxpayer dollars. It's because it's got to be going to the drug cost. And if it's going to the drug cost, who's ultimately paying that price? Well, it's the consumer. Obviously, the money's got to be passed on to someplace. It's just retail politics, and it's retail consumers. The price has to be made up because every one of you guys are in business for profit. And I think that's great. That's called America. We're able to do that. But I want to kind of bring down on some things that may be, need to be clarified. Um, for instance, when uh, Senator Marshall was asking the question of why is it that some drugs aren't able to make it to the market, and uh, I, I, I believe it was said that they are if they're the lowest cost. But Mr. Hudson, when that comment was being made, you were shaking your head saying, because what Senator Marshall was asking is, what prohibits drugs from coming to the market, especially competitive drugs? Because everybody says competitiveness is what brings down the price, and I agree with that. But I don't think you actually agreed with, is it Joyner? With Mr. Joyner's answer, when he said it's based on formula, whichever is the cheapest for the consumer, and as I was noticing just reading your body language, you was going like this. Can you explain... Uh, more for your perspective, what prohibits drugs from coming to the market? Yeah, I think I think what I was perhaps reflecting was a, a, a lack of unknown, because you know, as I said, in 2018 we launched a lower price uh, analog. You know, in the insulin market last year, a lower price direct equivalent made in the same factory, mm. and you know you would expect if price was the answer, and perhaps we talk at slightly different terms, you know, I, the use of cost versus price, I'm not quite sure what it means on both sides, but I'm, I'm reflecting on the fact that if the intent of the chair and everybody here is to lower the price of medicines, and we do, and it doesn't change for patients, I don't know so you brought, you, brought a, you brought a generic to the market and uh, that was significantly cheaper than, yeah. than the other one, but it, it didn't reflect the patient's... Well, it, didn't, it just didn't get listed in anywhere. If price is really the motivator, it would That's have been interesting. listed. And, and who prevented that from being listed? I'm, I'm, you know, I was not part of that conversation. But I mean, but the PBMs is the one that helped bring that to market, right? Well, my assumption is Your assumption? that the PBM... I think you're being very politically pl plight here, and I appreciate that. Uh, but I think we can all read between the lines on this one. Mr. Ricks... Uh, when you're talking about rebate checks, because the comments were made earlier because the question was asked about rebates, and our PBM officials over here, they were saying that uh, the PBMs go to their customers, which I'm curious of who the customers are, because I think the public would assume that it goes to the public, to the individuals, to the person buying the drugs. But I know I have six kids that seem to always be in the emergency room that always seems to be getting prescription drugs of something, um, and I've never got a rebate check. So who's the customers? Where do you send your rebate checks to? Yeah, thanks for the question. We send them to the PBMs, as mentioned. But where, where does the check actually get mailed to? Does it get mailed to someplace uh, inside well, the United increasingly, States? Well, increasingly, we were instructed to send them to the GPO Where's the GPO at? I think it was asked earlier, right. uh, the, the various organizations you have up there. But most of your checks, what country are they mailed to? Well, Outside the United States? Or? There are some that go outside the United States. And a tune of how many... How much would you give me a guess? Uh, our total rebates in the United States for commercial mm -hmm. um, that was paid to the major three last year was $8 billion. Okay. It's not a third, a third, a third, but it's roughly that. And a big chunk of that goes outside the United several States? Several billion, several billion. Goes outside the United States? But yet these are customers for inside the United States. Yes, right? These correct. are rebates for, for customers. For U.S., access to U.S. formularies, yes. But yet the your rebate checks aren't actually staying inside the United States, the biggest chunk of them. Correct, or a big chunk. That's yes. interesting. That's interesting, too. I wonder why that is. Um, and so when we start talking about customers, 
for the PBMs. Who are your customers that you're referring to that the rebates go to? Because you say the PBMs only keep 90, 97, 98, or are you guys send out 97, 98% of your rebates, right? And the customers is the insurance companies, right? Uh, so, Senator, the our customers, so Express Scripts has over 2,500 customers. But Many of them are employers, small, middle market employers, some large employers, labor unions are are, are our clients, so public self, sector so entities, or self and health plans. Self, and, and health plans, right? Yes, self, but also self-insured, your, yes. But also your insurance companies, right? Then the whole reason is to supposedly bring down premiums. But yet, if you look at this top line here where it says insure, the PBMs own the insurance companies that their, re that their rebates are going to. It's self-integrated. So you're rebating yourself. That, that is just, wow, great business model. And we wonder why prices are high to our consumers. And this is why the chairman and I actually agree on something. This isn't working for America. It's working for you all great. I mean, you guys are killing it. But if we're talking about bringing down prices, what have you all done to bring down prices? That was the whole reason why you guys were created, to bring down prices. We've seen nothing but them increase. It's not going to the pharmaceutical companies that are making it. It's not going to the pharmacists unless you own them. But if you own them, we really don't care if it makes it because upstream or downstream, depending on where they are in the integration chart, that's where you're getting your money back. And, there, and you wonder why you're here? Are you actually serving your purpose? Heck no. You're not. And as I said before, it's like the fox guard in the hen house. You've literally forced us to make the changes. And in my private company, if I have an entity that's not being effective for what their intended purpose is, I would shut them down. And that's what I think the solution here is. With that, I yield back.